we have a crisis in the world, tremendous crisis, and also crisis in our consciousness, in us. I see the urgency of change, radical revolution, mutation in the mind. I see it. It is necessary. There is complete quietness of the mind, and that which is silent has vast space. Only then that which is nameless comes into being. This is Urgency of Change, the Krishnamurti podcast. If there is no future, because the future and the past are now, then what is action? Hello and welcome to episode 136 of Urgency of Change. Season 3 of the Krishnamurti podcast continues with the format of carefully chosen extracts from the philosopher's talks. Each weekly episode focuses on a theme explored by Krishnamurti and the aim is to represent his different approaches to these universal topics. This week's theme is the future. Upcoming themes are the observer, effort and the sacred. This is a podcast from Krishnamurti Foundation Trust, based at Brockwood Park in the UK, which is also home to the Krishnamurti Retreat Centre. Situated in the beautiful countryside of the South Downs National Park, the Krishnamurti Centre offers retreats for those wishing to inquire into themselves in light of Krishnamurti's teachings. Please visit krishnamurticentre.org.uk for more information. You can also find our daily Krishnamurti quotes and videos on Instagram and Facebook at Krishnamurti Foundation Trust. If you enjoy this episode, please leave a review on Apple Podcasts, which helps our visibility. This week's episode on the future has five sections. The first extract is from the third question and answer meeting in Sanan. 1982, titled, What is the Future of Mankind? What is the future of mankind? It's a very good question. What is the future of you? What is the You, who are mankind, what's your future? As we now are living, which has been the continuity of the past, right? Continuity of wars, hatreds, divisions, the ugliness that is going on, the brutality, everything, If humanity continues that way, and that is you, continue that way, there is very little chance of survival, right? Obviously. If every country in the world is preparing for war, right, they are. The Unenlightened countries are buying armaments from the enlightened countries. Those who are highly civilized, like Britain, France, America, and so on, they are supplying armaments right and left to everybody. Because in, in Industry becoming necessary to supply arms, right? So their economy depends on it. So the the continuity of war, destruction, 
is guaranteed. And what is the future of all of us? Not only of us, of the coming generation, your children. It's really a very frightening world. You may talk about all the rest of the things we have talked about, gurus and followers and all that silly stuff. But this is a tremendous problem. If we go on as we are going on, we are bound to end up in a catastrophe of some kind or other. And if you accept that, it's all right. If that's what you want, it's perfectly all right. But if you say that's totally wrong, it's totally unholy to kill another, for whatever cause, for whatever reason, for your honour, for whatever reason, to kill another is the most, the denial of the most holy. The dog agrees. (laughs) So what is one to do? It's a really very serious question. What are you going to do? Because whatever we do is going to supply help hormones. And the politicians know all this. And the politicians' function is to keep isolation going. My country first. They have no global relationship, they have no idea of that. Right? That we can exist, we can only exist on this earth when we treat the earth as ours, all of ours, not British, French, German, or the rest of them. No. You, perhaps, and we realise this. Then, will it affect the whole consciousness of mankind if I really And if you and I really, deeply, do not belong to any group, to any nation, to any sect, will that affect the whole of the world? Of course, if there are all of us in this hall, in this tent, really felt this, would naturally affect the whole of consciousness, even of the politicians. The second extract is from Krishnamurti's third talk in Sanan, 1976, titled Is There Such Thing as Tomorrow? You see a beautiful house, beautiful woman, nice man, see the hills and the glory of the earth. When you observe, there's tremendous sensation, if you are at all watching. And then thought comes along and says, yes, how marvellous. From that begins the image-making the picture-making, 
the imagination. Now, is it possible to have this complete sensation, which is normal, healthy, sane, and not let thought seep in? You understand? When thought seeps in, you have the projection of tomorrow. I don't know if you see that. You see something extraordinarily beautiful, and all your senses are awake. Then thought comes along and says, I must have it tomorrow, which is the image-making, the pleasure, you follow, the delight of something beautiful, thought has taken over, created an image, and therefore there is tomorrow. You understand? So the tomorrow is the process of time, which is thought. So in the psyche there is only sensation, no tomorrow. I wonder if you see this. This little bit complex, is it? I see some people are not let me explain it more. We live in the hope of tomorrow. Right? Tomorrow to us is tremendously important. As yesterday, the images of yesterday, the, all that, is as important, the past, as tomorrow. So we live in the past and we, tomorrow becomes tremendously significant. So psychologically we are saying, what is tomorrow? There is tomorrow, which is Friday, <laughs> we have to do certain things, but psychologically we are asking, what is tomorrow? Tomorrow is the directive. Please do see the beauty of this. Tomorrow is the directive, the end, the goal. And so tomorrow psychologically assumes a great significance. And psychologically, inwardly, the tomorrow is the movement of thought in time, movement of thought as a material process in time. Tomorrow is a measurement, right? Where there is a measurement, there must be illusion. Oh, come on! I'm afraid you don't see all this. Look, measurement means comparing. I am not so beautiful as you are. I am not so intelligent as you are. Right? I want to be as intelligent as you are, which is measurement. Comparison is measurement. So thought is a process of comparison. So thought is measurement, which is the directive from what is what to what should be, right? Now is there Now, is there such thing as tomorrow in the psychological world? If I live with tomorrow, then it's a mechanistic process, right? Because thought has created tomorrow, psychologically. 
that may be an illusion altogether. So I must, I must, as a human being, I must find out, because that's the pattern, that's the conditioning, that's the accepted norm of existence, which may be totally absurd, because I'm concerned as a human being with the radical transformation, and we are examining the will, the will in action. And will in action means tomorrow, the directive. And is there such thing as tomorrow, psychologically, apart from biologically, physically? I need time, there is tomorrow if I have to learn a language, if I have to learn a drive a car and so on, so on. So is there a tomorrow? There is no tomorrow when, no, when there is only sensation and no image and no thought. I want if you capture it. Do you get it? See, people, especially so-called religious people, the monks throughout the world, have said sensation is totally wrong, control it. Because sensation leads to desire, and desire means the woman or the man. God cannot accept a man who has desire. You know, you have heard all this stuff put in different words. Therefore suppress desire, therefore control all your sensations, because if you don't, you are in, in the devil's hand. So we are saying something quite opposite, which is, sensation is natural. Sensation must exist, does exist, it's a fact. If you don't have your sensation fully alert, you are paralysed. You may be paralysed, because we have learned the art of suppressing. So there is this, all your sensations, when that sensations meet the movement of thought, then there is tomorrow, because thought is a fragment. Thought is a fragment because it is based on yesterday's memory. Thought is never whole. So sensation totally is whole, therefore there is no tomorrow. You understand all this? No, no, don't agree with me. Please, do it. See, see what happens when you do. Look at those hills, at anything. Look at it with all your senses fully awakened. Senses, not only your brain, your mind, because mind is part of the sensations, matter. It's all your sensations. Then you will see thought comes along and the image making begins and tomorrow will happen. But when there is only complete sensation without the movement of thought, there is only now. No tomorrow. The third extract is from the second question and answer meeting at Brockwood Park in 1984, titled The Future is Now. Would you enlarge on what you mean? by saying that the future is now, is it that the seeds underlined of the future are contained in the present, or that the future already fully exists on a different time scale? Would 
We certainly vary our questions, don't we? <laughs> this is a very complicated, like all human problems, question. Apart from scientific fiction and the theories which the scientists have about time as a series of movements and so on, apart from the demand that the future be comfortable, safe and happy and all the rest of it, what is time? Can we go into this together? Together, not just I speak, the speaker says something and you say agree or then throw it out. This requires really very serious inquiry. What is time? You can see time as a movement from point to point, right? To go from here to your house, to your home, there is a distance to be covered which will take time. That's obvious. And also, time is the whole movement of the past, right? in which is implied all the traditions, accumulated traditions, handed down from one generation off to another, their knowledge, their books, how to play the violin, and so on, the whole movement of this enormous past is there, of which we are, right? We are the past. The past being memories. You are the whole movement of memory now, right? That's a fact. So you are a bundle of memories. Whether you like it or not, that's a fact. Without those memories, pleasant, unpleasant, remarkable, satisfying, fulfilling, all those memories is in the present. And without those memories you would not exist. You may exist as a vegetable. No, probably a trees have their own way of responding. We won't go into that. So you are, we are, each one of us, memories, which is the whole process of accumulation of knowledge, responses, reactions, judgments, condemnation, acceptance and so on, this whole process which has brought about not only biologically, subjectively, is what we are now. We are, after forty, fifty thousand years, all those centuries, that vast sense of time is now, because you are that. That's clear, isn't it? And that is the future if there is no break. That's simple, surely.
Very simple example. Tribalism has existed from the beginning of time. I belong to that tribe which still exists in Africa and which exists in every country, glorified as nationalism. It's still tribalism. And that tribalism is dividing people, holding on to one's beliefs and all the rest of it. So, that is the whole accumulation of a group or a tribe or a nation, community, is the past. And if you consider after 50,000 years of human existence on this marvellous earth, we are about the same, right? Psychologically, subjectively, inwardly, we are still very, very, very primitive. You may pick up a telephone and talk to the other end of the world, but what you say is still rather primitive. Either it's business or cussing somebody or talking to somebody who said, Darling, how are you? It's the same process that has been going on, much more difficult in past centuries. Now it can be done in a second. So the past is now is what we are, and what we are after 40,000 years, you understand? How extraordinarily time has not changed us, right? Be honest to oneself. We have made so-called progress technologically, immense progress. Incredible. But inwardly we are somewhat, very, very little, on the frills perhaps, at the core we are barbarous, primitive, right? killing each other, all the rest of it. So time, please listen, time has not changed us. Right? Do we see this? So evolution has not changed the psyche. On the contrary, it's making it more and more strong. The psyche being the whole accumulation of memories, racial, national, tribal, religious, divisions, the ancient Sumerians, the ancient Hindus, they never called them Hindus, but as many, and the Egyptians, and from the <coughs> 40, 50,000 years we are still, after evolving, we are still primitive. Time is going on. Time is a movement. So the future is what we are now, right? We'll have wars. Now we know how to kill millions of people at one drop. We hate each other. We compete with each other, we are angry with each other, seeking sexual fulfilment, 
all different forms of fulfillment. They have done this, you understand? And we're still at it. And the future is still what we are now. So the future is now, not the seeds of it, the actuality of it. So is it possible to radically change all that, not allowing time at all? You understand? You understand my question? Time has not changed us. Evolution has not changed us. Different organizations has not changed us. Different religions has not changed us. Suffering has not changed us. And we say time will change, help us to change. I'm coming to that side. Give me a little time. <laughs> little time. <coughs> so we are saying if one looks to time that is tomorrow to bring about a change then it is futile hope. Right? That's clear. Therefore we have to inquire, what is change? Is change in terms of the future? Is change something from that which is to something else? Please go into, don't... I am this, I will be that. I will be that means future, brought about by desire, which is the essence of will. Desire is the essence of will. So you say, I will do something later. I will change gradually. Right? This. I will, I hope, to become noble. I'll get rid of my opinions. You follow? All that implies that you are looking to time to change. So we are asking, what is change? In which there is no time. You understand, sir? Moment I say to myself, I will change. You have already admitted the future. Right? I will become, I will change, I will flower, I will love. All that admits time. And time has not changed you. Right? Because we have evolved for 50,000 years, and that, that vast space and experience has no deep effect on us at all. So is there A totally, please understand, totally ending of something which has been. Now. You understand? What I mean? Wait, I'm suppose I'm greedy. You know what I'm of course everybody knows. Greedy, envious. Perhaps envy is better word. I'm envious. I can rationalize it 
these naturalities, uh, culturalities, part of the commercial process of gaining, losing, production, and all that stuff. So I can say I'm greedy. And man has been greedy from the beginning of time. Right? And time has not changed me at all. Because we have, through greed, we have created this appalling society, both commercially and through envy, which is comparison, we have destroyed each other. This is a fact. And can that envy and instantly, not I will, gradually. You understand my question? Have I made the question clear? Is there an ending? Ending. And not a continuity. A continuity implies time. Right? Oh, come on, sir. So, can, I, can one not allow time at all to enter into the world of change? That change means ending. Ending not knowing what will happen. Because what might happen is still hope, time, and so on. Is it possible to end greed, envy instantly, completely, so that it never exists anymore? Yes, sir. <laughs> That's why it's very important to understand the nature of time. Time is a movement, like thought, and time is necessary to learn a language, to acquire a skill. Time is necessary to go to the moon. Time is necessary to put a warship together, or a dynamo, or a motor. But psychologically, subjectively, if we think in terms of time and change, there will be never change. See what is happening. You have had United Nations at one time, uh, no, what was League of Nations? Now you have United Nations. Another blow up will be another kind of another uni- United Nations, but the same process, you understand? Reorganizing the same misery in different forms. So, is it possible? Not to have tomorrow. (laughs) To look at life, to live with that life which has no tomorrow at all. The fourth extract is from Krishnamurti's first talk in Sanan, 1984, titled Action Without a Future. So when we realise all time is now, but a marvellous truth, then what is action? What is our present action? 
We must begin with the actual to find out what real action is, which has no future. You understand what I'm saying? What is our present action? Action, the doing. Is either based on memory, the past, right? Memory which has been accumulated through various experiments, experiences. So the past dictates action, right? Are you following? Please go on. Or the future dictates the action, the ideal, the theoretical concepts of the communist, dialecticism, you know, all that. So, action is according to the past, memories, past remembrances, past hates, past dislikes, past prejudices, past personal attitudes, that's all the past. According to that past, there is action, right? Whether in the scientific world or in the psychological world. Action there is invention, right? You understand? Are you are we together in all this? Am I going all by myself? There was a collection of top scientists in a certain place, at Los Alamos in New Mexico in America. They invited the speaker to talk to them. There were seven hundred top scientists of America creating all the things for war. They asked, what is creation in science? You understand? What is creation in science? I said, there is no creation in science, there is only invention. We'll go into that part. What I want What the speaker wants to explain is that the past is so formidable, so strong, that guides, controls, shapes our action. Right? Or you have a future ideal, future theory. and act according to those theories as approximating as possible, right? Past, memories, and the future theories, ideals, concepts, dogmas, faith. So action is based on these two principles, right? Clear? Of course, this is simple. But when one realizes all action is now, there is no future action. You understand? Because the future is now. I must go over. If that is not clear, that all time is now, contained in the now. Right? We agreed, you agreed two minutes ago. At least shook your head. Some of you indicating that you are following, you saw the fact of it. Now, if there is no future, because the future is now, and the past is now, then what is action? We said. Action, as we know it now, is based on the past, 
memories, regrets, <coughs> guilt, experience, which is all knowledge, or the future, the ideal, the concepts, right? Theories, faiths. You act according to that. So you are acting according to the past or to the future. But the past and the future are now. Right? So what's the action? You understand my, you understand my question? Please do and don't give up. You have to exercise your brain your intellect, your energy to find out. Your passion to find out. What is action if there is if you no, know, what is action when all time is now? What's your answer? What's your deep, truthful answer? When the brain, listen to it, when the brain is conditioned to act according to the past or to the future. And when the truth is, all time is now, therefore there is no future but now. The future is contained in the now and the past is contained in the now. You understand all this? So what is action? I can tell you, but you see, you're waiting for me to tell you. <laughs> Too bad, you're not really going into it. You're waiting for somebody to explain all this. Suppose there was nobody to explain to you, what will you do? You have seen the truth of something, the truth that all time, the past, the future, is in the now. You see it. And you meet a man who says, look, what is action? and leaves you. And you have to find out. Because when once you have seen the truth that all time is now, it, that truth will never leave you. You understand? It's like a thorn, like an arrow in your body that will not be extracted, pulled out. So you have to answer it. And you, you won't answer it because you are incapable of answering it. Because our brain is conditioned to the past, action, action according to the past or according to the future. So one has to tackle that problem first, whether the brain can be free from the past. Careful now, I, I need memory to function in the world, right? <coughs> to go to my office, to do lab, to work in the laboratory or in a factory or some skill, I need great deal of time, great deal of knowledge. There are, there's a becoming there. Right? I don't know, but I will know. That same movement, same, it is extended, that same thought is extended into the psychological world. I am this, I will be that. Right? Now, you perhaps have seen for yourself very clearly the truth that all time is now. And the, spe the speaker says, find out. 
but his action. Right? Your action has been, according to the past memories, past training, past experience, which has conditioned the brain, and also conditioned the brain to the future idea, ideal, concepts, I must be, and so on. Can the brain be free of these two? You understand? Are you following all this? You understand my question, sir? Yes. Uh-huh. Can the brain, which has been conditioned to act according to past memories, or thought has projected a concept, an ideal, a theory, according to which you are acting. The brain is conditioned that way. Can the brain be free of that? Otherwise you will never find out what action now is. You understand? I can ex- well, somebody can explain, but it won't be your own depth of your own understanding. Clear? I'll explain it. I'll go into it. This will verbal explanation, naturally. It won't be something you yourself have discovered and therefore true, therefore live according to it. We have to inquire into what is perception, seeing, perceiving. One perceives the fact, actually, all time is now. That's a fact, irrevocable fact. No other clever man comes from and says, sorry, that's not like that. If, one, if what you have discovered is truth, then you can meet any challenge. You won't be bowled over. What is action, which is totally independent of the past and the future? Right? What is action which is not dependent on the past or the future, right? Is there an action which is so complete now, not fragmented? You understand? That's my action, (laughs) human action is based on the past or the future, therefore it's fragmented, right? is broken up. So we are asking, is there an action which is totally free of fragmentation? I don't even see the beauty of the question itself. Therefore there is, the speaker says, there is such an action. And that action is to see the seeing is the doing. There is no interval of time between the seeing, perceiving, understanding, and the doing. The understanding, perceiving, the seeing is action itself. Say, for instance, I'm working so hard, come on. (laughs) One perceives very clearly, objectively, without any bias, that all 
organized religions throughout the world, all of them are based on superstition, faith, belief, tradition. Obviously, with their various forms of rituals, dresses, fancy dresses, and so on, so on, so on. You see, that is put together by thought. Whether the ancient thought or present thought is put together by thought. Right? Therefore, as thought being limited, it must be limited. Because thought, I'll briefly explain it to you, thought is the outcome of memory. Memory is part of knowledge. Knowledge is outcome of experience. Right? There is no complete knowledge. In the scientific world, they're adding knowledge up, right? Bit by bit by bit by bit. Thousand people or hundred thousand people are adding to it, day after day, day after day. Right? Therefore, the more is limited. Right? So experience is limited. Experience of a man who says, I've reached God, is limited. Right? So, knowledge, whether now or in the future, is limited. Therefore, thought is limited. Right? So, anything that thought has put together, both externally or inwardly, is limited. So, action based on thought is limited. Get it? Hear it for the first time, for God's sake. All action is, if it is based on thought, will always be limited. Therefore, that which is limited must invariably create conflict. If I'm thinking about myself all day long, as most people do, it's a very small affair, right? I'm, I must practice, I must meditate, I must not do this, I must not do that. You follow? I must seek, I must have no conflict, I must meditate. It's all very self-centered activity. And therefore it's very limited. Right? So thought is limited. Is there an action which is not based on thought? Thought is the past. All the memories, all the tradition, all that. And thought also has projected the future. The ideal, the communist theories is still limited. So, if we are acting according to the past or to the future, it is still limited, right? Therefore, breeding enormous conflict and confusion, obviously. So, is there an action which is not based on the past or the future, because all time is now? Is there an action which is so complete now? You understand? Which means seeing something clearly is to act instantly. I see very clearly, the speaker sees very clearly to belong to any organization, especially spiritual organization is utterly detrimental, limited, therefore don't belong to anything. Yes, sir. 
because to belong to something gives us security. We won't feel safe. The Guru knows I don't, therefore I'll follow him. It's a form of se- deception, insecurity. Right? So, one perceives that an instant action. The whole thing, you are free of the whole so called spiritual leadership. That requires, you understand, it's not strength, mere perception of seeing what is. The final extract in this episode is from the fourth talk in Bombay, 1983, titled There are only two possibilities left for us. Some of you perhaps have heard of genetic engineering. It is man has not progressed, evolved, to the same extent as the technological efforts. So the genetic experts say that they assume a factor, a creative element handed down from father to offspring certain tendencies, qualities. This is what is called in part of the beginning of the engineering, genetic engineering. They are saying, since man, you have not changed fundamentally for thousands of years, perhaps, and they assume that man can be changed through genetic uh, interference. I'm putting it, we are putting it very, very briefly. It's a very complex question, which we're not going to discuss. But we, ha- we must understand what's going on. That as human beings had not deeply changed their characteristics, their way of life, their violence, they are hoping through certain chemical and so on to change the genes, the the factors of that create certain characteristic characteristics from the father to the son. And also we should consider what is happening in the computer world. We cannot neglect all this, the genetic engineering and what is happening in the computer world. They are trying, perhaps, successfully or not, to to create a mechanical intelligence, ultimate intelligence, through the computer, which will then think much more rapidly, more accurately, and in inform what, to the robots what they should do. This is happening already, and they are trying, as we have talked to others about this matter, they are trying to bring about a machine, a computer, which has ultimate intelligence. You understand all this? 
So there is on that one side genetic engineering, on the other the computer taking, acting as human beings, inventing generation after generation of computer, improving, and so on. I won't go into all of it. So what is going to happen to the human mind? You understand? What's going to happen to us when the computer can do almost everything that we do? It can meditate, it can invent gods, much better gods than yours. It can inform, educate your children far better than the present teacher educators. And it will create a great deal of leisure to man. One has seen in Japan on a television a, rob- a computer instructing a robot how to build a car, and the robot did some mistake. The whole machinery stopped and the computer told him what went wrong and the computer did the right thing and the whole thing started. You are understanding the nature of all this, the significance of all this. That is, what is going to happen to our minds when the computer and the genetic engineering are rapidly advancing, what's going to happen to us? We'll have more leisure, the computer will, and plus the robot will do a great many things that we are doing now in the factories, in offices and so on, then man will have leisure. And how will he use that leisure? You understand? Please go into this with me for a while. If the computer can outthink you, remember far more than you do, calculate with such astonishing speed, and gives you leisure. Either you pursue the path of pleasure, which is entertainment, cinemas, religious entertainments, you know, all the industry of entertainment, including gurus, and either entertainment or psychological search, seek out inwardly and find out for oneself a tremendous area that's beyond all thought. These are the only two possibilities left for us, entertainment or delving into the whole structure of the psyche and acting. 